Okay, you ready to go? Take your time, take your time. It's all good. Treat the conversation. Go. All right. Thank you for coming over, man. I really, really appreciate it. Um, just wanted to ask a couple questions about this release. Um, yeah, so we'll get into it. I mean, you wrote a book. How does that feel? I wrote a book. Uh, it's. I'm glad it's over. I'm still very much in the being an author phase where I am concentrating on the book release and everything that happens after a book release because it doesn't really stop there. But uh, it feels good to have uh, achieved it because I've never you know, written a long form thing quite that large and published it. So uh, it is a first, mm -hmm. a number of firsts and it's a weird feeling. It's a little bittersweet because I enjoyed making it and I don't really enjoy the after Part so much, but it's part of the process. So. Yeah. Would you find? Do you find the process of actually doing the writing more stressful than the promotions afterwards, or vice versa? No, I. I like the process of writing a lot more than afterwards. I, I like working on the book. You know, just getting all my ideas out. Yeah. Um, getting the words to the page, fiddling with the words, changing them around, experimenting, fucking up. I like that process a whole lot more than I like doing cover design and uh, proofreading and, and text design and all of that. That's fun too. That's yeah. that's not. It's not not fun. It's just not the same as writing. It's just a different kind of writing. Uh, so yeah. yeah. I mean, you're a writer. You're not a marketer. But that's part of the business when you're independent. A you're a writer, not a marketer. But the. Uh, the unfortunate thing about that is that you have to be a marketer as a writer, which, you know, the, the punk in me wants to rebel against that, but then the, uh, the downside of that is I might make five sales to a couple of mates, you know, my mum or something. Uh, otherwise, people aren't going to pay attention. Yeah. You need to grab people's attention in this age of distraction and low attention spans, you know, with technology having this grasp on us, it really does control us. Um, yeah, I think it's important to grab people's attention and yeah. so you have to promote yourself and market yourself and you do have to be shameless about it. This is not your first book, right? No, it's not my first because I do have uh, a book that I wrote before this uh, that I co-wrote with uh, Robin Walden and uh, Jay, the author, There's a Tale to the City. So this book that we're talking about now, The Street Poet, is it sort of bounces off that book. It, it develops the ideas that we established in that, in that book uh, and it kind of brings new ideas to a different light. Uh, and it explores the character of Johnny Locke, uh, who is first introduced in There's a Tale to the City. Um, but that book's much more a, uh, you could call it non-fiction really, the whole thing's a true story, we just really changed our names. Uh, but this one is, uh, I call it fiction, so it's a bit different. 
This is like the expanded edition. The expanded edition, yeah. This is like, obviously it features uh, moments from There's a Tale to the City, uh, but it's, yeah, it is a different story. It is all from one point of view, not three, uh, like that first book was, um, because uh, we all have different writing styles and I wanted to explore mine on its own. So. Now, I was just wondering if you could tell us a little bit, a little bit about uh, street writing and street poetry. So, what is it? I mean, because it seems to be kind of a relatively new movement, and you seem to be, you know, an integral part of that. Is you know, part of your life as well. Yeah. Um, so, street writing is literally the way I see it anyway. Writing that is inspired by the street. So, you know, maybe you, you witness something and you sit down, flip your notebook out, and, you know, write some notes. Uh, that's street writing and then from there you can, you can turn that into a story. You can make it more engaging than just boring street life. But street writing, street poetry, that yeah they are a relatively new movement that's happening especially here in Melbourne uh, where people are, you know, they're writing about the streets or they're all alternatively they're putting their writing on the streets for other people to read like a, I wouldn't call it graffiti art, I think that's the wrong way to look at it. I would call it paste up art, you are pasting your art up on, on the city for people to read on the streets, leave it on a train for someone to find or you know a bus, a bus stop or something. Uh, that's street poetry, that's street art as well. The idea is basically poetry or writing on the street or about the street instead of in a book, which is ironic actually because this is the book I'm releasing here. Your characters are in the book, um, Johnny Lock, so he sort of seems to discover what street writing is and like become a street writer after discovering Jay's Dear Strange Letters. Now, were you aware of what street writing and street poetry was before you saw those letters? At that point in time that I first found Jay's Dear Stranger Letter, uh, which was at the end of 2020, so we're all, you know, just coming out of lockdown for the first, one of the first times, going through, you know, we're all going through some shit that time. All I'd seen of this street poetry was there were a couple of other poets doing it as well. There was a boy under the bridge, uh, there, was, there was Jay with his letters, uh, and I would just stumble across them occasionally, not really thinking too much about them. Uh, but then it was Jay's letter that, that sort of uh, kindled this fire in me, I guess, in, like in the pit of my belly. I felt this need to do what Jay was doing, to put my writing out on the street, because I'm a, I'm quite, I'm quite a shy guy. I don't like public speaking. I'm very self-conscious of, of my work, and this was a way of me sort of freeing myself from that. Because once you put the the writing on the street, it's gone. It's gone. It could be there for a day, a week, a month, a year. It could be there for uh, as long as it wants to be there. But I have no say over what happens with it once I walk away from that poem. Sometimes I would even write it and just leave it there. I would never keep a second copy. It'd be the only copy that I'd write. Yeah, it seems like a bit of like a sort of like a form of therapy for you, sort of coming to terms with what you want to put out, what you want to say to people, but without actually having to say it. Um, and I mean, that was pretty clear, like from the character of Johnny Locke, like as he was coming to terms with you know, his paranoia and stuff like that, how the street writing helped him. So, what's your process for writing your poems? I mean, do you sort of observe? the streets for a couple of days and then you write some after that period or do you see something that you're interested to write about and then write about it straight away? Or it depends on the poem, depends on what's happening. If I'm in a writing mood, I'm not always in a writing mood, if I'm in a writing mood and I see something, if, I, if I'm actively searching for stories and I come across something, I, you know, I'll take my notebook out or my, my, the app on my phone and I'll start writing there and then. I'll come up with the first line of the poem and I'll keep going stanza by stanza. And that might not be the finished product, but I've written it at least in its first form. Uh, but that's not always the case. Sometimes I just write notes, dot points, you know, man walks past woman, man says X to woman, woman yells back at man. Just basic notes and maybe a feeling, some kind of mood or feeling, or maybe something that's happening in the scenery around them. And then later on I'll go back and I'll, uh, I'll change it up a bit and I'll use uh, my embellishment method, which is where I uh, will exacerbate or sort of exaggerate what's what's actually happened, because um, one example might be uh, a snake in McDonald's. There's a scene in my book uh, called A Snake in McDonald's where a woman in rather expensive clothing 
is, a, is having a go at one of the McCafe workers at McDonald's because she thinks there's blood upstairs dripping. And that happened, that all happened. But she didn't turn into a snake. She did not turn into a snake. She was just a vicious woman, I think. And vicious for me brings to mind, you know, the image of a snake of like a python or something, you know, fangs. So I just wanted to capture some sort of metamorphosis of this rich woman turning into a snake and then turning back into a, a human. That's not real. I think that's pretty obvious to any person reading it that she did not turn into a snake. So that's kind of an, an example of, of what will happen to my poems after I've written them. And in the first version of that uh, poem, she wasn't. She didn't turn into a snake. I just called her one. Um, so yeah, they, they go through a bit of a journey. You know, I, I don't. Uh, I don't always write the full poem there on the spot. So one thing, like, I mean, especially in There's a Tale of the City and also The Street Poet, um, a lot of the more the wilder stories that come out of it and the, you know, the more unique people that you meet comes from this t idea of talking to strangers and approaching people for those stories. Now, a lot of people would consider that risky slash dangerous. Have you ever had any bad experiences doing that? Yeah, it's dangerous. It's, it, it can be dangerous, uh, but it can also be really beautiful. Bad experiences, yeah, I've had some bad experiences. I've had, uh, sometimes my judgment's been a little off and I've thought someone might be a little more reciprocating of uh, having a conversation uh, and then, it's been, you know, they don't want to be bothered so I have to back off and leave them alone. That's fine, we're allowed to do that. I don't always want to be spoken to either. I've had some bad experiences. I've, uh, as you might see in the book, uh, someone tried to rob me when I was just trying to be kind. Uh, I have had addicts assault me. I've, I've had a few things kind of go wrong, but most of the time I'm aware of the stranger danger rule. I, I you know, I play it safe. Uh, I don't encourage anyone to put themselves in risky situations. That would be very irresponsible of me. Yeah. <laughs> well, have you had any good experiences though? Have you made any friends or connections doing the same thing yeah made plenty of friends just talking to strangers uh, one of them I've spoken about him recently on my YouTube channel I've uh, made friends with a man named Craig he goes by total on the streets and yeah he and I have become good mates we talk about books together we might see the same face walk past us every day on our lunch break and just choose to ignore that face but if we just give that face a chance and talk to, to them, uh, and yeah, some really nice, interesting conversations can emerge from that. Yeah, it sounds really special because I mean, clearly a lot of people don't do that, and a lot of people overlook, you know, people that are homeless or struggling on the streets and stuff, and sort of, you know, they would never be able to hear the stories that you get to hear from doing it, so it's... You do put your own life into perspective doing it, uh, but you also, you know, you do learn empathy. And I think empathy is something that we're struggling with a lot these days. We really struggle to just understand another person's point of view. We really struggle to critically think about things. Uh, and that was something that I, I myself was struggling to do. My judgments were a little off, my perception was a little skewed. And I wanted to correct that and rebalance myself. And so, yeah, talking to people.
Now, I have seen a video on your YouTube channel and stuff where you talk about, you know, people that say they want to be an aspiring writer and people who want to start writing and, you know, don't make that plunge. So what advice would you give to people that really want to become, start becoming writers, but they don't really know how or where to start? Well, the first step is exactly that. Don't call yourself an aspiring writer. Just call yourself a writer. That is the first step, that change of language that you use to associate with the act of writing. You take it seriously if you call yourself a writer, but if you call yourself an aspiring writer, you probably, probably never will be published because you're not taking it seriously. You either write or you don't. So the first step is just write. You worry about the other stuff later. Worry about who's going to publish you, if you're going to be self-published or traditionally published. Worry about what your cover's going to look like. Worry about how you're going to get it edited, how you're going to afford to pay a proofreader. You just worry about those things later. You don't worry about those things when you're writing because you might not finish the story. You might not get to the end of that story. You might give up on writing, take up knitting instead. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like a lot of it comes from that initial self-drive. Yeah. It's all on you sort of thing. It's all on you. No one's going to hold you accountable for your own writing but yourself, so you just have to do it. Yeah. So back to the street poet, just going back to you know sharing a little bit about the book just in this interview before the release. Um, how much of the book is fact and how much is fiction? Tricky question, I don't know, but... No comment. No, no. Comment. Uh, <laughs> we said before that you stretched things a little bit, but... I don't know with the exact percentage. If I were to take a guess, maybe it would be 60-40, yep. 70-30, somewhere like that. Uh, 60 being true and the 40 or the 30 being fiction. Uh, so it's, it's quite accurate, it's quite true to what I've seen. Yeah. And there's not, there's not a character in there that didn't exist. Yeah. Everyone existed in some form. Whether I gave them a name, I may have made up their name, I may have uh, you know, given them a different appearance to how they looked, or changed some of the things that they said. Or I've actually, in, in, a, few, in a few cases, I've combined two or three people that I've met into one character just, just to make it that much easier. I mean, at the end of the day, it's a story. Like you, still have to, you have to have people gripped, it's still a novel. It's a story. It's a story. And sometimes the truth is monotonous. I mean, the book is it is a fight against uh, the demonization of monotony. Uh, monotony is beautiful. If you can sit with monotony and just be content with it, then that's beautiful. Uh, and I wanted to convey a little bit of that, but that doesn't make for a 342-page book. So I didn't want this weird hyper-realism sort of feeling. I wanted it to be a little bit out of this world as well. And that's where the, the fictional elements come in. Yeah. Thank you for waiting. Your call has progressed in the queue and will be answered by the next available service representative. So I'm currently on hold with the Australian Business Register uh, so I can get uh, my business name approved for my publishing house so that I can go ahead with publishing my poetry book, which would be the first publication that the press releases. Your call has progressed in the queue and will be answered by the next available service representative. I'm still waiting. It's been about half an hour. This is the sort of stuff that matters. The that, that needs to be done and covered and, you know, it all needs to be done correctly for everything to go smoothly. So, that's, that's what we're going to do. Your call has progressed in the queue and will be answered by the next available service representative. Sorry about the wait. How did your childhood impact the things you write about and the type of writer you are, if it did at all? Uh, my childhood, yeah, it's, it's played a huge role in my writing, I think. My childhood shaped who I became, who I'm still becoming, and I'm always changing. If I'm talking about, you know, growing up, parents were divorced, I, we didn't have a lot of money, went to public schools, my brother and I went to a public school, we were bullied quite a lot. We knew of and were often around uh, a community of people who were drug users and alcoholics. It was just, it was normal to us to 
hear our neighbour screaming at his wife. It was normal for us to have things thrown through our window, hear that our neighbour had been broken into, or finding needles in the gutters on the side of the road on the way home. These things were normal. These were things that we just grew up with, and they weren't traumatic for me as a kid. But when I grew up and I moved out of home and I started seeing life in a different way, uh, those things, they felt like trauma. They felt like things I couldn't shake off. And I would say these are things that have had a huge impact on who I am because like, like you can see in the book, I am paranoid. I have had paranoia for years now, since I was a kid, really. Uh, always you know, worrying about, you know, can someone see through my window? Uh, is there someone under my bed? Am I being followed home? Uh, does that person who's eyeing me off have a knife in their pocket? Those sorts of thoughts, those are the sorts of thoughts that run through my head every day. Every day, a good portion of my day is taken up with thoughts like that. And this book was a, a fight against my own head. Uh, well, when I was 10, let's think about this, when I was 10 years old or 10 or 11, I can't remember exactly, uh, another kid at my school thought it was a great idea to chase me all the way around the schoolyard, uh, the school building, all of it, with a switchblade. And he just chased me, chased me, chased me, and he got me um, on my finger, this one. And from that moment on, I think, I've always had this weird obsession with being convinced that everyone around me has some secret hidden knife that they're about to pull out and attack me with. And also just growing up in a very like sort of ethnic, conservative family and, and beliefs and ideas, those things play a part in who I became as well and, and why I was so sheltered and reserved as a person for so long. Why I just, you know, the idea of being out late at night was terrifying to me. I didn't, why, why would anyone want to do that? I used to think, Fortunately, I'm past those now, but that, that's had an influence on my writing for sure. At the beginning of the street poet, you describe like why the reason you chose the Elias of Johnny Locke was sort of mirroring yourself, but also not. Um, can you give us like a brief explanation of that just here for the viewers? Well, it's this, it's this lock here that I wear most of the time, nearly all of the time. I remember when we were writing There's a Tale to the City, it was, it was Robin, Jay and I sitting around a, a, a little coffee table and we'd written the book initially in our own names and then and we're trying to come up with different names for ourselves. Jay wanted to keep his name as the same. Uh, and I, I was sort of joking around. I think I actually would have made a, a shining joke. And I think I said, you know, here's Johnny, classic. Uh, and I was wearing my lock at the time. It was just something that I used to wear and, and still wear. And I was just holding it and I went, what about, what about the name Johnny Lock? That sounds like an interesting character name. And it just stuck. It just stuck around, so I think I'll be writing stories from Johnny Locke's point of view for a little while. Yeah, and it is kind of a play on with my own name, because my middle name is Luke, so Jane and Luke, Johnny Locke, they're not so f different from each other, really. some of your biggest literary influences? I do read a lot. Less so these days while I'm creating. Who influences um, your writing? One of my biggest ones would have to be Helen Garner. I think at the moment she's a particular favourite of mine. She's Australian, but right? She's Australian, yeah. yeah. The first writers that influenced me were Tolkien. I loved Tolkien and I was, you know, obsessed with Lord of the Rings. Uh, and I wanted to be a fantasy writer at the beginning. I've gone on a very, I've gone on a very different uh, path since then. Do you think we'll ever see any of those secret hidden Johnny Locke fantasy manuscripts, or have they have they been thrown away? 
I've still got them. You still got them? I'm still out. They exist. I stumbled across them on one of my fantasy manuscripts recently, but I think I was about 16 when I wrote that draft and I was um, reading through it. <laughs> the scarified skeleton trails along in the bike lane like Santa Claus out of work. Picture a boy. Picture a boy who still lives with his mother, wrapped in big, bubble-wrapped dreams. I hop onto the... I hop onto the morning train and touch eyeballs with the window pane. It's late at night. Pitch black at the bus stop. I'll die for you. I'll die for you. Get ready. I'll have better call. As a writer, normally, I would be writing right about now, or working on a piece of writing, but... Since my book is finished, I haven't really been able to write too much. I haven't been doing any fresh writing, or I do have, you know, in my notebook and a lot of poetry and notes and observations and so on that I still write on a day-to-day -day basis, but I'm not working on any projects, which is a little bit strange for me, although I'm lying because I am working on a project. I thought it would be a good idea to release an album. A spoken word album that will uh, coincide with my book, The Street Poet. A selection of readings from the book with music. And uh, I decided that I wanted Melbourneian musicians to help me with this. I've managed to secure a good friend of mine, Gutsfuck. He's worked with me in the past on some spoken word stuff and now he's doing several of the tracks on this album with me. My dear friend Raphael Love. And just today I've managed to secure a fourth artist to help me with the album. His name is Lo Munro, or, well, his name is Mark. Maybe punk is back, but maybe it's not, and there are still gatekeepers. Maybe punk is back, but maybe it's not. And there are still gatekeepers, all of them robots. So the plan is for there to be 17 different readings in the album uh, that I have carefully chosen from different moments of the book that I hope capture the essence of the book from the, the observational street poetry to my experience with Melbourne and also the, the paranoia aspects of the novel as well. So I'm really excited to release this album, but it does feel strange to be spending most of my days and nights working on audio recordings and sitting in front of a microphone and manipulating my voice and uh, doing all kinds of foley sound effects and it's 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 bizarre doing these things as opposed to just sitting down and writing but it's really fun and it's a nice little break away from writing but I'm keen to get back to it once uh, once this book is out Like the book tends to get a little darker towards like the middle or sort of just before the end. Um, your thoughts like seem more negative about the world in general towards the end here. Were these thoughts that you always had like about the world and stuff, or only came to realize about like after putting yourself on the streets and like really seeing it for yourself? I like that you mentioned this because when I first wrote The Street Poet, that ending wasn't the ending, it ended in a, in a much more hopeful, positive place. Uh, and it was actually at that time that I was kind of wrapping up that draft of the book that I had my had my laptop stolen from me. And it was at that time that I was assaulted on the streets. And for about two weeks, I went into this reclusive version of myself where I didn't want to leave my house and I was, I was anxious. And I'm not much of a crier, but I felt like I needed to cry all the time. I felt this anxiety in my chest. I. I was suspicious of everyone. Every time I was on the street, I was, I was looking over my shoulder. I was, uh, I wished I had eyes on the back of my head. I was that afraid. I was constantly trembling, constantly shaking. And then I decided life has just given me the greatest gift. Life has given me the ending to my book. And I realized that, yeah, I was a very hopeful person. And I, I am a very optimistic person most of the time. But I was really starting to fall into these cynical ideas again. You can still have cynical ideas while being an optimist. You can balance both. Uh, and so I went from being this really optimistic person who meditated and was very calm and relaxed and 
I, I went from being that to being someone who actually had emotions and reacted to things when they happened to me, as humans should. I experience all of the emotions as everyone should. Uh, and that, that balance between optimism and, and pessimism uh, really started to come out for me and I started to understand a bit more about my own human nature, but human nature in general. Uh, and something that I deal with a lot is, is this concept that Kurt Vonnegut talked about, the, uh, the existential hum. We're all existentialists really, but yeah, for me I'm always feeling it, that sort of limbo state of not understanding what's going on with me, not understanding what's going on around me, being pulled like a tug of war from being optimistic, being pessimistic. Uh, and so the ending of that book was meant to be a fine balance between the two, where there is some chaos, there is some drama, there is a climax, and then there is a bit of a, a settling down point at the end as well. So, And that's also just classic story structure as well. You do need a bit of a rise before you can have a fall. So, yeah. Sounds like a really like, human experience, with, like a human way to live. That's the fuck, that's, that's the interior files. Uh, crying, screaming, throwing up. Okay, and uh, that's the, oh, there it is, there's the baby, how oh, beautiful, Chai, what's up baby, I'm gonna throw up, now we wait, what are we doing right now, Jaden, what, what are we doing, so today is deadline day, so I'm uploading the book for print, I'm setting the release date, and submitting the print interior files, and the cover files, and all of the metadata, uh, to release this book, which is uh, stressing the fuck out of me, this close to throwing up. I'm so mad about the um, the conversion rate between Australian dollars and USD. So annoying. But proceed to payment. Submission, submission, submission. It's a good thing. Okay, we'll get those card details on. Let's get those. Psych! Let's get those card uh, details on the screen. <laughs> I don't even know why I'm rambling about it. Congratulations, your title submission was successful. Alright, let's go get drunk. Let's go! Let's go! Let's, let's go! go! Let's go! Hey! hey. Yeah! <laughs> this is crazy! This guy just said end of an era, but this is l just the fucking beginning. This is just the beginning. <laughs> There are stories, stories, There are stories, 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 Just finally, sort of wrap, to wrap things up, what keeps you writing? Like, with all the pressure of a working day, um, and working a day job, um, and the economy of the world, all the problems with art and technology, how do you hold up being a writer? What's the alternative? Like I was just saying before about the existential hum, either I'm a creator or I fall into the nine to five trap. The alternative for me is I'm not gonna be fulfilling myself and that hurts me. And it doesn't matter to me what sort of economy we're living in, what's going on around me in the world, what turbulence is happening. I have to create, I just, I have to make something. I have to always be making something. There's always a project going on. Uh, that is my re relaxation. My relaxation isn't really, you know, going on a holiday. My relaxation is working with what I'm passionate about, and so that's what keeps me going. I have to write, I have to tell stories. Uh, the real question is, yeah, what is the alternative? And the alternative to me is that nine to five, getting home and making dinner, going to sleep, starting the cycle again. I, that's, that's not for me, that's not, that's not right for me, so it's, yeah, it's just natural for me to be creating, so that's what keeps me going, really, I think. Sounds like a very, like, punk word, I don't know if it's punk or if it's just being true to myself, I mean, yeah, I guess I suppose you'd call it punk, and I, I, I describe myself as a punk because I can't find any other term to describe uh, what it is, and even punk doesn't really nail it on the head that it's, it's close. So, all right. Well, it's been a absolute pleasure talking to you, man. Um, thanks for letting me interview you, and thank I, you. I hope all the questions went up, prodding, prodding you too much and stressing you out. Um, not too much. Yeah, not but, too uh, much. All right. Thank you.
so I've just had a delivery of books that need to be signed and are going out to you, my readers. So we have in here so many, so many copies of this book um, and I'm going to be signing them all. Thank you.